when God's people don't seek God, hmm. in every brother or sister, in every child of God who is of the church of the living God, there will come a moment in your life as a saved, born again, converted, new creature in Christ Jesus, that you will commit a sin and you'll think to yourself, how could I be saved, converted, and be a new creature in Christ Jesus? How could I be saved and do that? You'll experience in others, your brethren, who, by the way they behave, you would have swore that they were not converted or of the church and the living God. But yet they are. See, the difference is, <laughs> is chastisement and repentance. That's the difference. That's the difference between a true child of God and a true child of the devil. See, you come to me as a church of the living God, like oh, some of the emails that I, I get and look at them. I'll read some of your emails and, uh, hey, I love you. And I'll read some of them. It's like, whoa, <laughs> wow, okay, sister, wow, wow. But yet, saved, born again, converted of the church of the living God. And then some things will happen as the church of the living God where you'll go into an enterprise or go on into an endeavor half-heartedly seeking the Lord, but yet in reality not seeking the Lord at all. What do I mean? Uh, a brother of ours who unfortunately... Um, can I will refuse and he refuses to have any um, fellowship with each other due to circumstances. When we're in heaven, it'll all be forgotten. But a brother of ours um, up north, by the way, if you were to ask him, it's like, and every single thing that you do and all adventures and all things that you do, do you always seek the Lord in everything you do? <clears throat> If you say no, guess what? I'm gonna, or if you say yes, guess what? I'm going to call you a liar. Because this brother of ours up north, he went into an, uh, uh, an adventure, so to speak, which not only cost him financially, but also cost him physically. Then you were to ask that brother, it's like, did you seek the Lord in that? And he would first right away say, well, I thought I did, but, but apparently no. Apparently, no. These are some pretty deep things to consider. See, again, you come to me as the church of the living God. It's like, Brad, I'm in sin. <laughs> Repent! Repent! For the Lord makes it worse, worse for you. You go to an easy believism heretic, I'm in sin. Doesn't affect your salvation. Now think about that. Think about that. As, as many of you have come to me, but like, Brad, I'm in sin. What do I tell you? You need to repent. You need to get that taken care of. But if you would go to one of these so-called teachers of easy believism, what's the first thing they tell you? doesn't affect your salvation. Why do they say that? See, they say that to make a lot, to put into your mind, well, okay, since I'm in sin, but here's I got this guy who I'm looking up to um, saying to me that it doesn't affect my salvation. Hence, putting in, into the person a light attitude on sin. While it is true, if you are saved, born again, converted of the church of the living God, a new creature in Christ Jesus, you're sealed until the day of redemption. 
Uh, yeah, that's true. It doesn't affect your salvation. But see, of the church of the living God, you tell that brother or sister that comes onto you, uh, you need to repent and get that uh, taken care of right away. But onto these devils who are Christians, doesn't affect your salvation. Hence, instilling upon you a light attitude on sin. And they'll say things, well, hey, remember David? Yeah, God still used David. Yeah, yeah, he did, didn't he? Uh, 2 Samuel chapter 12. Please get your authorized version of the scriptures. And please turn with me in the scriptures to 2 Samuel chapter 12. Follow me along in the scriptures we will be reading through today, okay? Uh, they'll say things to you like, well, God still used David. Yeah, he sure did. But you know what they don't like to talk to you about? What it cost David. Uh, 2 Samuel chapter 12, verses 10 on to verse 12. This is after David killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword of the Ammonites. Uh, after he went in unto Bathsheba and had a child through um, adultery, fornication, that kind of stuff. Okay? Okay, then he kills Uriah the Hittite. This is afterward. Okay? God put away his sin. I've covered this in other videos. But, yeah, God forgave David. God still used David. But here's, here's what it cost him. Verses 10 on to verse 12 in 2 Samuel chapter 12. Now, therefore, the sword shall never depart from thine house, because thou hast despised me. And has taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be thy wife. Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will rise up evil against thee out of thine own house, and I will take thy wives, wives from before thine eyes, and give them unto thy neighbor, and he shall lie with thy wives in the sight of the sun. For thou didst it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the sun. Pick your pardon, brethren. Sorry about that. So yeah, God still used David. But the sword never departed from his house. And his own son, Absalom, lay with his own wives as a result. Yeah, God still used David. But it cost him plenty. It behooves us that there are those of the church of the living God that can go into endeavors, enterprises, without truly seeking the Lord and waiting upon him for his response, whether it is uh, of his will or not. We like to put options before the Lord and to have him pick one. We'll see about that in a little bit. So, let's look into this, shall we? Turn to the book of Joshua. We're going to look at two examples of God's people, God's people, not going to the Lord, and something that was set before them, okay? Go to the book of Joshua. We're going to be looking at two examples in the Old Testament and three examples in the New Testament, okay? So Joshua chapter 9, Joshua chapter 9, when God's people don't seek God. Okay? Joshua chapter 9, verses 1 unto verse 21. Follow me along. Okay? And it came to pass when all the kings which were on this side Jordan, in the hills and in the valleys, and in all the coasts of the great sea over against Lebanon, the Hittite and the Amorite, the Canaanite, and the Perizzite, the Hivite, and the Jebusite, Jebusite heard thereof, that they gathered themselves together to fight with Joshua and with Israel with one accord. And when the inhabitants of Gibeah, of Gibeon, or Gibeon, excuse me, of Gibeon heard that Joshua had, what Joshua had done unto Jericho and to Ai, they did work wily, and went and made as if they had been ambassadors, and took old sacks upon their asses, and wine bottles, old and rent, and bound up. 
and old shoes and clouted upon their feet, and old garments upon them, and all the bread of their provision was dry and moldy. So it says that they acted wily, these inhabitants of Gabaon. Okay? Yes. To make it look like they were something that they were not. Okay? And these, by the way, were of those whom the Lord had said unto Joshua and the children of Israel that these are ones that are to be exterminated. Because these were of those whose land Israel was to inhabit. Okay? So these guys, hearing what uh, we just saw about what the Lord had done through Joshua unto Ai and whatnot, they were like, oh, wow. So they cooked up a ruse, right? Now check this out. Let's keep reading. Verse 6. And they went to Joshua unto the camp at Gilgal and said unto him and to the men of Israel, We be come from a far country. Now therefore make ye a league with us. And the men of Israel said unto the Hivites, Peradventure, ye dwell among us, and how shall we make a league with you? It's like, and they said unto Joshua, We are thy servants. And Joshua said unto them, Who are ye? And from whence come ye? And they said unto him, From a very far country thy servants are come because of the name of the Lord thy God. For we have heard the fame of him, and all that he did in Egypt, and all that he did to the two kings of the Amorites that were beyond Jordan, to Shion, king of Heshbon, and to Og, king of Bashan, which was at Ashtaroth. Wherefore our elders and all the inhabitants of our country spake to us, saying, Take victuals with you for the journey, and go to meet them, and say unto them, We are your servants. Therefore now make ye a league with us. So this is also indicative of those who try to infiltrate the church of the living God. Okay? Trying to put on other things to make it look like they are something they are not. The difference is the, uh, the inhabitants of Gabaon, which were what? Were Hivites. Okay? And you read in verse 1, the Hivites were of those that were to be exterminated, okay? Number one. Number two, like those who try to uh, infiltrate, they dress themselves up to make themselves look more humble than they actually are, to make themselves look like they're contrite and broken, converted, but they're not. And then, let's not get ahead of ourselves. Let's uh, pick up at verse 10, and all that he did to the two kings of the Amorites, oh, I already read, we already read this, but we'll read it again, that were beyond Jordan to Shihon, king of Heshbon, and to O, king of Bashan, which was at Ashtaroth. Wherefore our elders and all the inhabitants of our country spake to us, saying, Take victuals with you for the journey, and go to meet them, and say unto them, We are your servants. Therefore now make ye a league with us. This our bread we took hot for our provision out of our houses on the day we came forth to go on to you. But now, behold, it is dry and it is moldy. And these bottles of wine which were filled were new, and behold, they be rent. And these our garments and our shoes are become old by reason of the very long journey. Verse 14. And the men took of their victuals and asked not counsel at the mouth of the Lord. And Joshua made peace with them and made a league with them and let them live. And the princes of the congregation swear unto them. They made an oath. They swear unto them. Okay? This will also tell us just how seriously God, our Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, takes oaths and vows and swearing. 
You ever uh, come across someone that's like, I swear to God, it's like, shut up. The Lord rebuke you. I used to know a devil who would always say that. It's like, I swear to God, who's rotten, who's burning in hell right now. Um, he'd always used to say that. It's like, I swear to God. And whenever you hear someone say that, it's like, right away, the red flags ought to come up. It's like, ah, why are you saying that? Must mean you're lying to me. Right? Yeah. Let's continue. And it came to pass at the end of three days after they had made a league with them, that they heard that they were their neighbors and that they, and that they dwelt among them. And the children of Israel journeyed and came unto their cities the third, on the third day. Now their cities were Gaban and Kipharoth, Kipharoth and Beroth and Kirjath Jarim. And the children of Israel smote them not, because the princes of the congregation sworn unto them by the Lord God of Israel. And all the congregation murmured against the princes. So see, because they swore unto the Lord that they weren't going to hurt these people, whom in verse 1 we learn were slighted to be devastated, but yet they asked not counsel of the Lord and swore unto them, hence, because they swore to them in the name of the Lord, they couldn't do anything to them. Tells us again how seriously our Lord takes vows and oaths and stuff like that. That's why we are admonished not to do so. Okay, let's continue. But all the princes said unto all the congregation, We have sworn unto them by the Lord God of Israel. Now, therefore, we may not touch them. This, will we, this we will do to them. We will even let them live, lest wrath be upon us, because of the oath which we swear unto them. And the princes said unto them, Let them live, but let them be hewers of wood and drawers of water unto all the congregation, as the princes had promised them. Now, when you look into the history of these children, of these people of Gabeon, okay, they, didn't, they were not like what are these infiltrators, these coadjutors today, who come in to seek to do mischief and cause, and cause distraction and all that stuff. No, these guys were genuinely scared for their backside, and because of this, they were submissive onto what, Israel imposed upon them and never rebelled upon that. Okay, unlike the coadjutor infiltrators that we deal with today who want to worm in just so they can plant a dirty bomb and blow it off and cause all kinds of problems for everybody. Okay, that's the difference. But in like manner, they worked wily and disguised themselves for what they really were, nonetheless. Okay. So we see, verse 14, And the men took of their victuals and asked not counsel at the mouth of the Lord. And these Hivites who were of the people of Gabeon, verse 1, they were slighted for devastation, for destruction. But the people acted rashly and didn't seek counsel at the mouth of the Lord. And as a result... Now, go to 2 Samuel chapter 2. 2 Samuel chapter 2. Uh, uh, 2 Samuel chapter 21. 2 Samuel chapter 21. Now, these children of Gabeon, because of what we just read in Joshua, they lived amongst the people of Israel. And because of that oath, God honored that oath. But King Saul, King Saul, 2 Samuel chapter 21, verses 1 on verse 9. Then there was a famine in the days of David three years, year after year. And David inquired of the Lord, and the Lord answered him. It is for Saul and for his bloody house, because he slew the Gabeonites. Saul, because he slew the Gabeonites. These same Gabeonites, which Joshua 
and the elders of Israel swore unto. King Saul, what does it say there? Because he slew the Gabanites. The same Gabanites from Joshua chapter 9 are the ones that Saul slew, the descendants thereof. And the king called the Gabanites and said unto them, Now the Gabanites were not of the children of Israel, but of the remnant of the Amorites. And the children of Israel had sworn unto them. And Saul sought to slay them in his zeal to the children of Israel and Judah. Okay, verse 2 already addresses what we just looked at, okay? Wherefore David said unto the Gabanites, What shall I do for you? And wherewith shall I make the atonement that ye may bless the inheritance of the Lord? Now get a load of that. Get a load of that. King David going to the Gabanites, who previously in the book of Joshua worked wily and fooled Joshua and the children of Israel. They swore unto them, but because of the oath, the children of Gabanites here, Number one, they weren't killed because of the oath, but they were submissive to what the children of Israel imposed upon them, unlike these coadjutors, again, that come in and try to worm their way in and cause all kinds of problems. Okay? These guys were submissive onto what Israel imposed upon them. And not only because of the oath, but because of that submission, the Lord honored them. Okay, now let's let's uh, continue. But see in verse 3, King David was going to them to see how what he could do that they may bless Israel. See that? Verse 4, And the Gabanites said unto him, We will have no silver nor gold of Saul, nor of his house, neither for us shalt thou kill any man in Israel. And he said, What shall... What ye shall say, that will I do for you. And they answered the king, The man that consumed us, and that devised against us that we should be destroyed from remaining in any of the coasts of Israel, let seven men of his sons be delivered unto us, and we will hang them up unto the Lord and Gebeah of Saul, whom the Lord did choose. And the king said, I will give them. But the king spared Mephibosheth, the son of jo Jonathan, the son of Saul, because of the Lord's oath that was between them. There again, uh, uh, oaths and vows and stuff like that. God takes them very seriously. Very seriously, eh? Between David and Jonathan, the so son of Saul. But the king took the two sons of Rispah, the daughter of Ea, whom she bare unto Saul, Armoni and Mephibosheth, a different Mephibosheth, and the five sons of Michal, the daughter of Saul, whom she brought up for Adriel, the son of Brazilii, the Mahalothite. And he delivered them into the hands of the Gabanites, and they hanged them in the hill before the Lord. And they fell all seven together, and were put to death in the days of harvest, in the first days in the beginning of barley harvest. And as you, if you were to continue reading, because of that, the Lord was entreated for the land because they did that. Because uh, King David gave those people over to the Gibeonites because of what Saul had done. Okay? So see, they didn't seek the Lord in Joshua. And because of that, people that were slighted for destruction were safe. And they made a vow unto them. And because of that... Saul went to go and slay them, but because of the vow they were safe, and because they were submissive unto the terms of Israel, hence, there was a famine in the land because of what Saul had done. See, the point is, if Israel never would have done that, and gone to the Lord first, this troubling by the Gabeonites would never have been there even though the Gabanites in themselves were submissive to that yoke that was put upon them by Israel. Nonetheless, if Joshua and them would have gone to the Lord when these guys came to them in 
acting wily, this would not have happened. Even though the Gabanites under servitude turned out to be honorable. Even though. Okay? Now, while we are in 2 Samuel, go to 2 Samuel chapter 6. 2 Samuel chapter 6. Beg your pardon. Getting over a sickness kind of thing. 2 Samuel chapter 6, verses 1 on to verse 11. When God's people don't seek God, Again, David gathered together all the chosen men of Israel, 30,000. And David arose and went with all the people that were with him from Baal of Judah to bring up from thence the ark of God, whose name is called by the name of the Lord of hosts that dwelleth between the cherubims. And they set the ark of God upon a new cart. Interesting and brought it out of the house of Abinadab, that was in Gebeah, and Uzzah uh, and Ahio, the sons of Abinadab, drave the new cart. And they brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which was at Gebeah, accompanying the ark of God, and Ahio went before the ark. And David and all the house of Israel played before the Lord on all manner of instruments made of fir wood, even on harps and on psalteries and on timbrels and on cornets and on cymbals. And when they came to Nechon's threshing floor, Yuza put forth his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it, for the oxen shook it. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzziah, and God smote him there, for his error, and he died by the ark of God. Smote him there, just like that. Touched the ark of God. He, he Uzziah here, or what was this guy's name again? Um, Yuza, excuse me. Hey, the, the, the oxen with the ark of God on a cart uh, shook the, it shook. Hey, I'm helping God out. Steady it. God's like, no, no, no. Zoom. Zapped him dead. Hmm. Why is that? Let's continue. And David was displeased because the Lord had made a breach upon Yuza. And he called the name of the place Perez Yua, that means breach, Yuza to this day. And David was afraid of the Lord that day. But you don't say. And said, How shall the ark of the Lord come to me? So David would not remove the ark of the Lord unto him into the city of David. But David carried it aside into the house of Obed-Edom the Gittite. And the ark of the Lord continued in the house of Obed-Edom the Gittite three months. And the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and all his household. Now, there's a lot that we got to go over in this, isn't there? Isn't there? Number one, Yuza thought he was helping out God, doing something good for God by taking hold of the ark when the oxen on a cart, which the uh, ark was carried, okay? He thought he was helping God out by doing something that was not a sign for him to do, by touching that which is holy, the ark. And God... Boom, smote him dead for it. Something to learn. But the biggest thing for us to take away is, look at what David said in verse 9. And David was afraid of the Lord that day and said, How shall the ark of the Lord come to me? How should the ark of the Lord come to me? Hmm. And when you look at verse 3, and they set the ark of God upon a new cart. Mm, that's where all this starts. This is right there in verse 3. And they set the ark of God upon a new cart. 
and brought it out of the house of Ab Anna, Abinadab that was in Gebeah. And Uzzah and Aho, Ahio, excuse me, the sons of Anna, Abinadab, drave the new cart. Um, was Yusa and Ahio, were they Levites? You might be saying, well, what's the point? First Chronicles chapter 15. First Chronicles chapter 15, verses 1, on to verse 14. Here's the answer. See, David's like, he said to himself, How, how's the ark supposed to come to me then? Did David go to the Lord on how to move the ark? But obviously not, because he put it on a cart, right? And because, number one, he didn't do it God's way, because why? He didn't go to the Lord first. King David, of all people. King David, who didn't go to the Lord about how to move the ark of God, the ark of the covenant. King David, who wasn't seeking the Lord, but yet seeking flesh when he saw Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Yet the Lord still used them. But he paid a heavy price. First Chronicles chapter 15, verses 1 on to verse 14. And David made him houses in the city of David, and prepared a place for the ark of God, and pitched for it a tent. Then David said, this is afterwards, okay? This is afterwards. If you were to continue reading in 2 Samuel, it doesn't mention this in here in 2 Samuel. But all scripture works together, okay? At first, David didn't inquire of the Lord on how he should move the cart. He was afraid of the Lord. Boop, rightfully so. Then he's like, well, how, how should, how is the ark supposed to come to me? Why don't you go to God about that, genius? He did. Then David said, Verse 2 in First Chronicles chapter 15. Then David said, None ought to carry the ark of God but the Levites. For them had the Lord chosen to carry the ark of God and to minister unto him forever. And David gathered all Israel together to Jerusalem to bring up the ark of the Lord unto his place which he had prepared for it. And David assembled the children of Aaron and the Levites of the sons of Kohath, Uriel the chief and his brethren, an hundred and twenty of the sons of Meurai, Asaiah the chief and his brethren, two hundred and twenty of the sons of Gershom, Joel the chief and his brethren, an hundred and thirty of the sons of Elsaphan, Shemaiah the chief and his brethren, two hundred. Of the sons of Hebron, Eliel the chief, and his brethren fourscore. Of the sons of Uziel, Amaniadab the chief, and his brethren an hundred and twelve. Is this the same Amaniadab as before? I don't think so. I don't think so. And David called for Zadok and Abiathar the priests, and for the Levites, for Uriel, Asaiah, and Joel, Shemaiah, and Eliel, and Ammoniadab. And he said unto them, Ye are the chief of the fathers of the Levites. Sanctify yourselves, both ye and your brethren, that ye may bring up the ark of the Lord God of Israel unto the place for that I have prepared for it. For because ye did it not at the first, the Lord our God made this breach upon us, for that we sought him not after the due order. Don't look at me. Look at the verse. Don't look at me. Look at that verse. Okay? So the priests and the Levites sanctified themselves to bring up the ark of the Lord God of Israel. So, because they didn't, see, they thought they were doing something good. But they weren't doing it the right way because they didn't seek the Lord first. Well, all the while, they thought they were doing something good, just like Joshua. Hey, here these guys came from a long way. We're, we're, we're you know, we're supposed to be God's uh, ambassadors in a way in the Old Testament under the law, being an example. 
They came from, oh, sure. Did they ask the Lord? No. No. What happened because of that? Again, with, uh, with the Gabanites, had they never sworn unto them foolishly, and that was foolishly, 2 Samuel 21, verses 1 on to verse 9, about the famine would never have happened. Even though the Gabanites were submissive unto the conditions for peace. Absolutely. And of course, because they rashly made an oath, swore unto those people without seeking the Lord. And because David didn't inquire to seek the Lord, excuse me, on how to move the ark, Yuzah got killed. See? So, God's people not seeking the Lord and paying a price for it. It happens. But let's go to the New Testament now. Let's go to the New Testament now. Go to Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. <laughs> Acts chapter 1, which is this dispensation, the time of the Gentiles, okay? Remember, this dispensation, the time of the Gentiles, came in with the death of the testator, not the birth, okay? But Acts chapter 1, <laughs> verses 15 on to the close of the chapter, okay? And in those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples and said, The number of the names there, the number of names together were about 120. Men and brethren, this scripture must needs have been fulfilled, which the Holy Ghost by the mouth of David spake before concerning Judas, which was guide to them that took Jesus. For he was numbered with us and had obtained part of this ministry. Now this man purchased the field with the reward of iniquity, and falling headlong, he burst asunder in the mist, and all his bowels gushed out. And it was known unto all the dwellers of Jerusalem, insomuch as the field is called in their proper tongue, Akledama, that is to say, the field of blood. One second, brethren. For it is written in the book of Psalms, let his habitation be desolate, and let no man dwell therein, and his bishop prick let another take. Wherefore of these men which have companied with us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John unto that same day that he was taken up from us, must one be ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection. Now, pay attention. See, in Joshua and Samuel, they didn't go to the Lord first at all. Had they gone to the Lord first, things would have been different. Okay? And they paid a price for it on both occasions. But now we're looking at something similar, but a little different. Let's read. And they appointed two. Joseph called Bar Barsabbas, who was surnamed Justice, and Matthias. And they, <laughs> get a load of this. And they prayed and said, Thou Lord, they, hey, they're seeking the Lord, aren't they? Ooh, hold on, hold on. And they prayed and said, Thou Lord, which knewest the hearts, which knowest the hearts of all men, Shoe whether of these two thou hast chosen. <laughs> uh, you are the church of the living God. You get why I'm laughing, don't you? We'll, we'll get into it in a second. That he may take part of this ministry and apostleship, from which Judas by transgression fell, that he might go to his own place. And they gave forth their lots. And the lot fell upon Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. Inter 
interesting to note. You look up the name Matthias here. Um, Matthias here. You don't see his name appear anywhere past Acts chapter 1. Do, do the word search uh, in whatever, in the Strong's or whatever. You do not see Matthias past Acts chapter 1. But here's the thing now. Let's, let's dissect this a little bit. Okay? Verse 23. They appointed two. They appointed two. Verse 24, and they prayed and said, Thou, Lord, which knowest the hearts of all men, shew whether of these two thou hast chosen. <laughs> so, the Lord who made heaven and earth, the Lord who knows tomorrow, the Lord who can provide and does provide all things for you, you're going to give him an option. Lord, this is what I want to do. I want to do either this or this. Which one do you choose? <laughs> so you are making... Think about it. Look at, look at the text. Okay? Was this done in guile? Stra no, no. This was done in ignorance, though. You do not see Matthias past Acts chapter 1. But they picked two. They, and they appointed two. They did. Verse 24. And they prayed. Lord, here's what we've chosen. You choose one of these. So, you're going to the Lord. Lord, this is what I've chosen. You bless one of my decisions. Now let's get real here, brethren, sisters. How many of us are guilty of doing this exact thing? See, they were right in that they went to the Lord and they prayed and said, Thou, Lord, which knowest the hearts of all men, shew whether of these two Thou hast chosen. They were wrong in the these two. Yes, Lord, you know the hearts of all men. Who do you choose? Did they wait on the Lord? No. They cast lots. And the lot came from Matthias. And he was numbered with the eleven apostles. But was that who God chose? See, they went to God with their options and ask God to bless their options that he that they presented to him. They prayed to him. Yes, they did, but they didn't wait on the Lord. Did they? Like I said, this was not done in malice or evil or anything like that. Not at all. Not at all. No, of course not. But what we get from this is well, yeah, Judas was going to be replaced, but not by the dictates of the apostles, not by what they have decided. Not by what they have decided. You are going to go to God. It's like, God, here's what I want. You pick one of them. Blah. Giving God, our Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, the creator of everything, you choose between option A or B. <laughs> Good luck with that. Like I said, was this done in guile or malice or anything like that? No, of course not. This was done in ignorance. Absolutely. It wasn't in ignorance when they prayed to the Lord because... Uh, Judas, someone to replace Judas. Absolutely, that wasn't. But in ignorance that 
Here, God, here's who we choose. You pick one of them. When the apostles themselves know that it was the Lord who individually picked every single one of them. <laughs> but who did God choose? He, he, he obviously, because you don't hear of Matthias after this. Was Matthias used? I don't know. Can you find it for me? See? But who did God choose? You know the answer to this. Acts chapter 9. They, uh, they prayed. Whom do you choose? He didn't choose any. <laughs> See, God our Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, is the only one who has the right and the power to go with option C. <laughs> okay? <laughs> you, you think about it. And how many of you today... Lord, I choose this or this. Which one are you going to bless for me? Boop. What if he chooses none of that, but chooses something way out here? It's like, huh? What? Even though everything seems to line up. But the Lord's like, okay, everything lined up, but he takes it way over here. It's like, whoa, 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 what's going on? <laughs> See? They sought the Lord. Yes, they did. Did they wait for him? No. No, they didn't. They cast lots, and here was Matthias. Had they had waited, well, what was eventually going to come anyway, but who did God choose? Who did God choose? Acts chapter 9, verses 1 on to verse 18. And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus to the synagogues, that if, they, if, he, that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, I love this, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against pricks. And he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise, and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. And Saul arose from the earth. And when his eyes were open, he saw no man. But they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight and neither did eat nor drink. And there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him, and to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. And the Lord said, Pay attention to this. And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the street which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus, for behold, he prayeth, and has seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hands on him, that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard by many of this man, how much evil he hath done to thy saints at Jerusalem. And here he hath authority from the chief priests to bind all that call on thy name. Uh, go back to Acts chapter 1, really quickly, please. Acts chapter 1. <clears throat> Verse 24. 
And they prayed and said, Thou, Lord, which knowest the hearts of all men. Amen. Shew whether of these two thou hast chosen. Who did God choose? Huh? Now go back to Acts chapter 9. Now let's read verse 15 in Acts chapter 9. And the Lord said unto him, Go thy way. For he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will shew him how great things he must suffer for my namesake. And Ananias went his way and entered into the house and putting his hands on him said, Brother Saul, the Lord even Jesus that appeared unto thee in the way as thou camest has sent me that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. And immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales. And he received his sight forthwith and arose and was baptized. So the Lord picked who? Saul, who had become Paul. He didn't pick the two that the, peep, that the apostles Innocently enough, yet ignorantly enough, when here, Lord, here's who we choose, you choose one of them. Lord's like, uh-uh. I choose Saul of Tarsus, not what you put upon me to choose for you. See, they they went to the Lord, but they didn't wait for him. Okay? They immediately chose Matthias. Granted, he was he chose Paul. Okay, but they wanted to replace Judas right now, right now. Come on, Lord. Here's what we should want. Bless one of them. Let's go right now, right now. Going way too quick. Going way too fast. Going way too quick. Going way too fast. They were right, like I said. And what they prayed about, yes. But they had to have it right now. They had to have that replacement right then and that, right now, right? We're waiting on the Lord. Hi. <laughs> How many of you are guilty of that? Hi. Come on. Be a man. Be a woman about it. Come on. You know you have. So have I. Lord. Something's got to be done. This is what I think ought to be done. You choose one of them. Brad, <laughs> I choose that. Huh? Then it works out for the good because it's according to his will. See. Now let's look at um, Acts chapter 21. Acts chapter 21. Saul, who became Paul. Acts chapter 21, verses 1 on to verse 14. When God's people don't seek God. Acts chapter 21, verses 1 on to verse 14. And it came to pass that after we were gotten from them and had launched, we came with a straight course unto Cus, and the day following unto Rhodes, and from thence unto Patra, Patara. And finding a ship sailing over unto Phoenicia, we went abroad and set forth. Now when we had discovered Cyprus, we left it on the left hand and sailed into Syria, and landed at Tyre. And there, for there the ship was to unlade her burden. And finding disciples, we tarried there seven days, who said to Paul through the Spirit that he should not go up to Jerusalem. Now hold up. Hold up. Look at verse 4. That's a capital S. That means the Lord himself. The Lord is that Spirit. Okay? The Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father. One God, Spirit, soul, and body. Okay? said that to you enough. 
You know where I stand on that. Check the playlist if you have any questions, okay? But, okay, look at verse 4. And finding disciples, we tarried there seven days, who said to Paul through the Spirit, capital S, the Lord himself, that he should not go up to Jerusalem. The Lord, and the Lord is that Spirit, God our Father, Jesus Christ, said to Paul, he should not go up to Jerusalem. Don't go to Jerusalem. And when we had accomplished those days, or continuing, obviously, we departed and went our way. And they all brought us on our way with wives and children till we were out of the city, and we kneeled down on the shore and prayed. And when we had taken our leave one of another, we took ship, and they returned home again. And they returned home again, excuse me. And when we had finished our course from Tyre, we came to Potlamus and saluted the brethren and abode with them one day. And the next day, we that were of Paul's company departed and came unto Sisera. And we entered into the house of Philip the Evangelist, which was one of the seven, and abode with him. And the same man had four daughters, virgins, which did prophesy. And as we tarried there many days, there came down from Judea a certain prophet named Agabus. And when he was come unto us, he took Paul's girdle and bowed his own hands and feet and said, Thus saith the Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost and the Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father, is that spirit. The Lord is that spirit. So shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man that owneth this girdle, and shall deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. In the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word shall be established. So the Lord, on two occasions, number one in verse four, who said to Paul through the Spirit that he should not go up to Jerusalem. Lord, hey Paul, don't go up to Jerusalem. Number two, Hey, Paul, um, so shall the Jews of Jerusalem bind the man that owneth this girdle and shall deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. But wait. And when we heard these things, both we and they of that place besought him not to go up to Jerusalem. The Lord said, don't go up to Jerusalem. The Lord said, if you go up to Jerusalem, this is what's going to happen to you. The people of the Lord, hey Paul, don't go up to Jerusalem. You know what Paul's biggest sin was? Paul's biggest sin was his pride. Prove it to you? Okay. Verse 13. Then Paul answered, What mean ye to weep and to break mine heart? For I am ready not to be bound only, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. Now, hold up. Look at verse 13. Do you, is it honestly, reasonably, can we, can we think, can we imagine that Paul was aware of how Peter atrociously denied the Lord on three occasions? Can we logically, reasonably concur that Paul was aware of Peter's three denials? I say yes. As learned as Paul was, as versed in other cultures and stuff as Paul was. I think it is safe, this is my personal opinion, okay? I think it is safe to say that Paul knew of how Peter had denied the Lord, okay? So when you see Paul say, for I am ready not to be bound only, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus, 
We know that Paul definitely would stand to it. Obviously. We know, unlike Peter, before he was converted, before he was converted, okay, we know that Paul, unlike Peter, when put to the fire, he wouldn't deny the Lord. And after Peter was converted, of course he wasn't going to deny the Lord. But the Lord told him, it's like, you're going to deny me. And what did Peter say? We, we know it, right? Though the world deny thee, yet I never will. Then three times he denied him. And you read in Luke, the Lord looked upon Peter. The Lord looked upon Peter. Oh. This is a bit of a rabbit trail, but go with me. The Lord told Peter, hey, you're going to deny me three times. And after you deny me, okay, after you're converted, then strengthen your brethren. Before that, he said, uh, Shimon, Shimon, Satan has desired to have thee, that he may sift thee as wheat. But when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. That he said before, he told him, it's like, hey, you're going to deny me three times, okay? But after Peter, okay, the Lord said to him what he was going to do. And Peter's like, I'll never do it. Then he did it. And then the Lord turned and looked upon Peter. Can you imagine what that must have felt like for Peter? Looking eye to eye with God the Father, who is in the process of getting roughed up to pay for sins. And they made, I'm, I'm assuming they made eye contact, obviously. Can you imagine what that must have felt like? When the Lord tells you something not to do it and you do it anyway. And then when the ultimate consequence comes upon you, you can sense that the Lord's looking at you like, I told you so. Can you imagine that? Doesn't that just break you? Or do you seek to justify, ah, oh, well, I, it doesn't affect my salvation. <laughs> you easy believers and devils are missing the point, obviously. Let's continue. But Paul, Paul, unlike Peter at that time, we know, definitely would have stuck to his guns, don't we? Verse 14. And when he would not be persuaded, we ceased, saying, The will of the Lord be done. So, the Lord, on twi uh, twice, don't go to Jerusalem. You go to Jerusalem, you're going to get bound. And then the people is like, hey, Paul, don't do it. And Paul answered, what mean ye to weep and to break my heart? For I am ready not to be bound only, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. And amen, he would have. And when he would not be persuaded, that stubborn pride of Paul. Stubborn pride of Paul. Why do you think in Romans chapter 7, Paul speaks the way he speaks through the Holy Ghost? Because Paul's greatest sin was his pride. The Lord and the people. A total of three admonitions not to go to Jerusalem. And he still went. That's pride there, buddy. Boop. If I've ever seen any. Okay? Paul's sin, his greatest sin that he struggled with, was pride. Like mine is. Like many of you. Like many of you. And of course, now let's go to Acts chapter 27. Now, it's obvious the Lord didn't want him to go to Jerusalem. The Lord, it's obvious, would have brought Paul to Rome a different way. But, because Paul was proud, stubborn, didn't want to listen to anybody, but he's like, why are you doing this? I'm ready to die. And yes, he was. 
And he went anyway. He got to Rome, but in a different way than obviously the Lord probably would have brought him. But let's look at Acts chapter 27, verses 9 on to verse 26. Now when much time was spent, and when sailing was now dangerous, because the fast was now already passed, Paul admonished them, and said unto them, Sirs, now get a load of this. I perceive that this voyage will be with hurt and much damage, not only of the lading and ship, but also of our lives. So Paul is warning them, hey, maybe we should wait. Verse 11. Nevertheless, the centurion believed the master and the owner of the ship more than those things which were spoken of by Paul. Hmm. So isn't that kind of interesting where the Lord and the people were warning Paul not to go to Jerusalem and, or, and here they are going to Rome, which obviously the Lord probably would have had a much easier, safer way to get to Rome than what this way, who Paul in his disobedience and his pride chose to go to Jerusalem. And boy, he paid a heavy price for that, didn't he? Didn't he? Now, granted, the Lord used it to his advantage, absolutely. But it was obvious that the Lord had another way. But Paul chose his own way, didn't he? This is the greatest of the church of the living God, by the way. Our example. You start thinking you're all perfect over there, don't you, huh? You start thinking that you don't sin. Or that you're, you're walking the straight path, the narrow path, so perfectly. Huh? You never mess up, huh? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Go take a long walk off of a short uh, short pier there, buddy. Huh? Yeah, why don't you go pound a little sand there, huh? Yeah, yeah, get over yourself. Get over yourself. This is Paul. But like I said, I found it very interesting. Here he's warning them, and yet they didn't listen to him. Not that that doesn't happen to any of us, right? <laughs> Let's continue. And because the haven was not commodious to winter in, the more part advised to, the more part advised to depart thence also, if by any means they might attain to Phoenicia, Phoenice, excuse me, and there to winter, which is an haven of Crete, and lieth toward the southwest and northwest. And when the south wind blew very softly, don't don't miss that. <laughs> Paul warned them, hey. Dude, we shouldn't go. Centurion is like, I'm going to believe the guy who does this for a living, not you. Then the wind blows softly. Mm, don't miss that. It's part of it. And when the south wind blew softly, supposing that they had obtained their purpose, losing thence, they sailed close by Crete. But not long after, there arose against it a tempestuous wind called Euroclidon. And when the ship was caught and could not bear up into the wind, we let her drive. And running under a certain island, which is called Clodia, we had much work to come by the boat, which when they had taken up, they used helps undergirding the ship and fearing lest they should fa fall into the quicksands, strake sail, and so were driven. And we being exceedingly tossed with the tempest, the next day they lightened the ship. And the third day we cast out with our own hands the tackling of the ship. So everything that Paul so far has been saying has been coming to pass, hasn't it? Kind of like how he was admonished not to go to Jerusalem. Yeah, don't, don't miss that little deliciousness there, okay? Let's continue. And when neither sun nor stars in many days appeared, and no small tempest lay on us, all hope that we should be saved was then taken away. But after long abstinence, Paul stood forth in the midst of them and said, Sirs, ye should have hearkened unto me, I told you so, and not have loosed from Crete, and to have gained this harm and loss. And now I exhort you to be of good cheer, for there, for there shall be no loss of any man's life among you, but of the ship. 
For there stood by me this night the angel of God, whose I am and whom I serve. The angel of God, whose I am and whom I serve. The angel of God, uh, that be the Lord, saying, Fear not, Paul. Thou must be brought before Caesar, and lo, God hath given thee all them that sail with thee. Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer, for I believe God that it shall be even as it was told me. Howbeit, we must be cast upon a certain island. So, where Paul didn't heed the warning from God, didn't seek the Lord, look at what he went through to get to this point. And because they didn't hear, hearken to the man of God, warning them, you see? Very interesting, huh? Very, very, very interesting. Like I told you, the sin of Paul, his biggest sin that he struggled with was pride. Now, a lot of you in that circumstance is like, well, I would have obeyed. I would have, you know, the Lord said, don't do that. Yeah. Really? So every single moment of your life, every single moment of your life, buddy, you're in perfect obedience and submission unto the Lord. You know, there was a guy a while ago who was a sinless perfectionist uh, devil who, who I blocked almost immediately. Um, <laughs> you can't, you know, even, even you easy believism devils, even you guys are at odds with these uh, sinless perfection weirdos. Um, you can't reason with these people. You really can't. I mean... I have never, to this day, 13 years saved by our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father, I have never been able to have a positive scriptural discussion with anyone who was a die-hard, sinless perfection individual. There, there's something amiss there. There's something amiss there. That pride in them. I don't sin anymore. You're a liar. You just sinned. I don't sin anymore. I haven't sinned since the Lord saved me. Yeah, huh? Yeah, good for you. Yeah. Well, you just need to uh, be with the Lord. You just need to know the script. Oh, shut up. You can't, like I said, you really can't kneel, you really can't get through to a lot of these people who are sinless perfection idiots who are void of logic and reason. That's what an idiot is, okay? You really can't. Someone like a babe who's struggling with that, yeah, but these guys who over years and years and years are sinless perfection devils, that level of pride in them is just so far gone. It's incredible. Like I said, I have never, in 13 years saved, I have never come across someone who is a sinless perfectionist and be able to reason with them out of the scriptures to show them the truth that they're a liar and there is no such thing as sinless perfection on this earth. Never been able to get through to anyone face-to-face, mano-a-mano. And I've had my fair, uh, fair share of opportunities. Trust me. Every single time. God, nowhere. Nowhere. See, just like you easy believers and devils, though, your, your badge of pride is, I'm saved because I believed. You hinge on that because it's what you do. Look at me. I'm saved because I believe. These sinless perfection twits. I don't sin anymore. I'm sinless. See? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Let's go to 1 Corinthians. Oh, yeah. Yeah, 1 Corinthians. Of course we had to go there. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Again, of course, excuse. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Beg your pardon, brethren. 1 
1 Corinthians chapter 5. It's hot in here. It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and such fornication as not so much as named among the Gentiles, that one should have his father's wife. Wasn't his mother. I believe if it was his mother, our Lord would have told us. No, it says his father's wife. And ye are puffed up, and have not rather mourned, that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. The puffed up. We're not judging you. Oh, that you've done this sin, we, we think it's gross, but we're not going to judge you. Hey, look, we're Christians, and we're not judging you. Puffed up. We don't judge anybody. All, like in the church buildings, all are welcome. For I verily as absent in body, but present in spirit, lowercase s, have judged already. Oh, he judged. He wasn't there. Paul judged. And he's our example. <laughs> when someone says to you, don't judge, every single time it's to a defensive mechanism for you being of the church of the living God not to point out their sin. Hey, you know, if you want to eat a pork sandwich uh, lav layered in mayonnaise and whatever, go right ahead. I'm not going to judge you on that. But when it comes to sin, we're kind of supposed to judge. Starting with ourselves and one another. For I verily as absent in body, but present in spirit, have judged already as though I were present concerning him that hath so done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when ye are gathered together in my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, to deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Now, in Romans chapter 12, okay, in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 on to verse 2, okay, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, separate than that, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now, the question comes up about this guy who did this. Was he saved, born again, converted of the Church of the Living God? Well, he either was saved or he was not saved. Okay? If he was saved, having his father's wife, boom. Okay? That's pretty serious. It would make more sense, apparently, if he were lost, right? But what if he were saved? I personally believe this man was saved and just got really messed up. I, I do believe this man was saved. There are those out there who believe that this, whoever this guy was, that he was not saved. I believe he was saved. And we'll look at that here in a little while, okay? But, okay, we are to, uh, we have the church of the living God. What does Romans chapter 12, verse 1 say? I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, set, uh, set apart other than, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Now, if this guy were of the church of the living God, and I believe he was, was he doing that, keeping himself holy, separate other? No. He was doing something that wasn't even named among the Gentiles. Okay? It's right there that people say, no, this guy was lost. You got to remember, brethren, any one of us of the church of the living God can commit any sin that these lost devils do. We can. The Lord will forgive us. The Lord will be screaming at us because he lives within us. But as we have already witnessed, Paul was warned. 
and he in pride disobeyed the Lord. Look at Joshua. Look at King David, who didn't have a permanent indwelling of the Lord themselves. It is very possible. It is very possible. But if this man were saved, he was not being holy, other than, separate. He wasn't what? He wasn't presented, presenting his body as a living sacrifice. Well, obviously not. And look at verse 2. And ye are puffed up, and have not rather mourned, that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. Verse 2 in Romans chapter 12. And be not conformed to this world. We're not judging you. We're Christians. We don't judge you. We're, all are welcome here. Hey, we're, we're better than these church of the living God because they're going to call you on your sin. But we, no, no, remember, it doesn't affect your salvation. See, and be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And ye are puffed up and have not rather mourned that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. So see, the guy who was doing this was not presenting his body a living sacrifice. He wasn't being holy other than, than that. Okay? And that it's not named among the Gentiles. Guess what? It's named among the Gentiles today. And they were all puffed up. Like the Christians in the church buildings. We don't judge you. All are welcome here. You're a sinner. You're welcome to be amongst the people of God. <laughs> But going off, if this was now, if this man wasn't saved, or if he was, I believe he was. Nonetheless, verse 5 to deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. And there are those of the church of the living God. <laughs> I look, I look. I, I love the fact that so many of you email me. Wow. Wow. But some of the things that you have told me, some of you. Wow. Wow. Brethren, we as, as the Church of the Living God can really make a mess of things. We as the church of the living God, when we decide, because remember, the Lord isn't doing anything forcing us to obey him. Neither is Satan forcing us to go against God. We have the ability to choose. God wants us to choose him. But see, God will honor what we choose. And if we choose to go astray as the church of the living God, Hand over to Satan for the destruction of this, the skin suit. Okay? We as the Church of the Living God can really, we can really get messed up with a lot of things. And you need to repent of these things. Or else you'll be handed over for the destruction of your flesh. That means that God's going to kill you. To destroy the flesh through disease, death, whatever it may be. And think about the judgment seat of Christ. That God had to kill you because you wouldn't cease from doing something that he told you not to do. Or that you wouldn't, that you were continuing in sin. And we all sin every day. We do, yes. Yes. But when you, as the church of the living God, decide to give yourself over to that, ignoring God speaking to you, you know you can quench the Spirit. You know that, don't you? And yeah, some of you, my brethren and sisters, you know that better than I do, don't you? 
And like I said, man, some of you who email me some of that stuff, uh, thank you, and I, I've responded to many of you. Wow, that's... Wow. Yeah. Let's continue. Verse 6. Your glorying is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? Purge out therefore the old leaven. That old leaven is reference to sin. That ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened. For even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, meaning the old man, neither with the leaven of malice or wick and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Malice and wickedness, that old man. Sincerity and truth, symbolic unto the new creature in Christ Jesus. Okay? And leaven, which you can read in Exodus chapter 12, verses 14 on to verse 20. We're not going to go there. But leaven was a, is a, for our instruction in righteousness, is a type of sin. Okay? Under the law, you know, they were supposed to eat unleavened bread. You know, unleavened bread, which symbolizes sincerity and truth. Nothing to make it rise. You put a little leaven in some uh, bread, it's going to rise. A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. Okay? Talking about sin. All right? I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators, yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world, or with the covetous, or extortioners, or with idolaters. For then must ye needs go out of the world. But now I have written unto you not to keep company, if any man that is called a brother, is called a brother, be a fornicator, or covetous, or an idolater, or a railer, or a drunkard, or an extortioner, with such an one know not to eat. For what have I to do to judge them? Judge? <laughs> For what have I to do to judge them also that are without? Do ye, do not ye judge them that are within? Do we need to expound on that? Or is that pretty self-explanatory? But them that are without, God judgeth. Therefore put away from among yourselves that wicked person. So right there, verse 13, also, but them that are without, God judgeth. God is angry at the wicked every day. And God judgeth his own people. God will judge the world, absolutely. Okay? But, but let's go now to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 1 on to verse 11. Dare any of you having a matter against another go to law against the unjust and not before the saints? Do ye not know that the saints shall judge the world? And if the world shall be judged by you, are ye unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Know ye not that we shall judge angels? How much more are things that pertain to this life? If then ye have judgments of things pertaining to this life, which we do according to the scriptures, okay? Set them to judge who are least esteemed in the church. I speak to your shame. Is it so that there is not a wise man among you? No, not one that shall be able to judge between his brethren. But brother goeth to law with brother and that before the unbelievers. What is this reminiscent of? Uh, reminiscent of Acts of Romans chapter 12. Of Romans chapter 12 verse 2. Okay. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will to God. 
Are you proving to the lost world by your conduct according to scripture when you have to go to the, to the lost world over trifles, over little matters? Hmm? Think about that. Think about that. Verse 7 in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Now therefore there is utterly a fault among you, because ye go to law one with another. Why do ye not rather take wrong? Oh, that's the hard part, isn't it? Why do ye not rather suffer yourselves to be defrauded? Nay, ye do wrong and defraud, and that your brethren. Oh, gotta get even, don't you? Oh, and I'm talking to a couple of you right now, aren't I? Oh, you just gotta get even, don't you? Hey, hey, hi! I, 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 I'm in that myself. Okay? I put myself in there too. Yes. Yes. It's our old nature. It's that old man in us. Okay? That's in the flesh. Okay? The flesh. Someone smacks you, right? What do you want to do? You want to smack them back. Someone offends you, you want to offend them back. We're not supposed to do that. To defend ourselves, yes. But you gotta get even, don't you? You gotta, you gotta drive it home, even when it's already been driven home. You just gotta get even. But they wronged me. So what? What do you mean, so what? Um, in about a hundred years, who's gonna care? They stole from me. The Lord will reward them. They lied to me. The Lord will reward them. But you got to get even, don't you? Don't you? Got to watch that, you know. And I'm here to tell you. You got to watch that. See, two plus the enemies of our Lord, of the church of the living God, those who hate us, that's what they want to instill in you when they attack you. They want you to attack them back to get involved in this endless, petty mishmash of insult, insult, exposing this, exposing that, a back and forth. It never ends. It never ends. That's what they want. Are we supposed to be as the world? Are we supposed to do war, uh, battle as the world? Yeah, want to get even, don't you? Why do ye not rather take wrong? How thin is that skin suit of yours? Hmm? Why do ye not rather suffer yourselves to be defrauded? Oh, but not you, right? Not you, yeah. Nay, ye do wrong and defraud, and that your brethren. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate. Effeminate there is men acting like women. Nor abusers of themselves with mankind. Reference to sodomites. Nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name in in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. And such were some of you. Such were some of you. Meaning exactly that, some, not all. So the inference is that yes, saved people. Unfortunately, can do exactly that in verses 9 and 10. Still be saved. Still going to heaven when you die. To deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. It'll cost you everything. <coughs> Your testimony will be shot. 
How is, how is anyone, how are you of the church of the living God who has given yourself over to anything of this world and living in sin, how is anyone who the Lord orchestrates a chance for you to witness, how are they to take you seriously when there's no difference between you and them? Why, why do you think lost people mock Christians? Because the Christians that are produced today from the church buildings look exactly the same as the world. Hmm? Yeah, why do you think the Christians today are a laughing stock? Why do you think I'm not a Christian? Because the Christians from the church buildings, the Christians today, they look identical to the world. And you, as the church of the living God, you're living in sin, okay? You're doing things of the world. And then, perfect example. Let's say you're of the church of the living God and you decide to get drunk. And in a drunken stupor, you're going to try to witness to someone when you're drunk? <laughs> okay but see you have the church of the living God you know better but what would happen if you got drunk and then the Lord orchestrated something where he wanted to use you and then you being drunk notice like oh wow and then afterwards oh it's going to cost you going to cost you plenty and plus, think of your testimony. Think of your testimony. Think of your testimony as you're puffing off of a cigarette. Someone sees you, and then you go and witness to them about the Lord Jesus Christ. You might be saying, well, we're, we're not supposed to care about what the, the world thinks of us or how we look onto the world. Uh, well, to an extent, yes. But remember Romans chapter 12, verse 2. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Who are you proving that to? Who are you proving it to? Look, if you've got to continually prove to yourself that what God says is right, true, and good for your life. Okay, if you're a babe, that's one thing. But if you've been of the Church of the Living God five, six, ten years, and you're still proving to yourself that God's word is good and true, and that you ought to live by it, there's some. There ought to be some cause for concern there. There really ought to be. Okay, who are you proving to? By your conduct and abiding by Scripture, unto the lost. Remember, we're ambassadors for Christ's sake. And the way you serve him reflects him. Okay? But yes. Yes. Yes, people. Yes. Anyone of the church of the living God can commit these things. They can. But it costs you. My, my cell phone is right here. That's why I do that. That's why I get all, a lot of the emails that you guys send me. I know for certain that a lot of you have been in this situation where you've given yourself over to sin. And the lost world has seen that. And because of that, your testimony has been shot a little bit. I know that from many of you. How important is that sin? Do you want to go to God about it, or are you continue not? Are you, or are you going to do it like, well, Lord, uh, I know I should give this up, but kind of half-heartedly. Second Thessalonians chapter three, verses six on to verse fifteen. Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ that ye withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly, and not after the tradition which he received 
of us. The tradition. What tradition? Let's keep reading. For yourselves know how ye ought to follow us. For we behaved not ourselves disorderly among you. Neither did we eat any man's bread for naught, but wrought with labor and travail night and day, that we might not be chargeable to any of you. Not because we have not power, but to make ourselves an ensample unto you to follow us. Now, the tradition there is defined in that context, okay? Verse 7. For yourselves know how ye ought to follow us. How to follow us. Second Thessalonians, the first epistle of Thessalonians, okay? The first epistle unto the Thessalonians in First Thessalonians chapter 4. You know, abstaining from fornication. Uh, Romans, not being like the world, okay? According to the scriptures, okay? To follow them according to the scriptures. To live our lives in accordance with the scriptures. How to behave. How to behave ourselves out there behind our closed doors when it's just you and the Lord, okay? But that's what it's talking about. For we behave not ourselves disorderly amongst you. Neither did we eat any man's bread for naught, but wrought with labor and travail night and day, that we might not be chargeable to any of you. Not because we have not power. Why? But to make ourselves an ensample unto you to follow us. What kind of example are you setting? And if you say that doesn't matter, then you might as well just call yourself an easy believism heretic and go ahead and yoke yourself up with Rome. Say it doesn't matter. Say it doesn't matter. See, that, that is what these easy believism heretics are all about. It's, it, it doesn't affect your salvation. Oh, yeah, you shouldn't do that. But don't worry. You're good. You're, you're saved. Never mind that your testimony is, not, is going to be shot. How is the Lord going to be able to trust you when you've made him look bad by the way you are living? How are, how are you going to be trusted with the true riches when you can't even judge the smallest matters and get so uber offended when someone pricks you on one? Or that you have to go to the lost. God have mercy on your soul, man. Woman. Huh? Verse 10. For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. For we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly, not working at all, but our busy bodies. When I used to work at the pizza place in the secular work uh, field, I worked for the Lord Jesus Christ. But when I used to work in the secular world, I met and ran across people who were so good at making themselves look as if they're doing something while doing nothing. That's actually an art form. There are many out there who are busy bodies making themselves look as if they're doing something when in reality they're doing nothing. Full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. See? Second Corinthians now, chapter 2. Second Corinthians, chapter 2. Second Corinthians chapter 2. But I determined this with myself, that I would not come again to you in heaviness. For if I make you sorry, who is he that maketh me glad, but the same which is made sorry by me? Now, this is going back to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Okay, about that guy who um, was being with his father's wife. And also how he rebuked them for putting up with it and being arrogant about it that they were putting up with it. Okay? And I wrote this same unto you, lest when I came 
I should have sorrow from them of whom I ought to rejoice, having confidence in you all, that my joy is the joy of you all. For out of much affliction and anguish of heart, I wrote unto you with many tears, not that ye should be grieved, but that ye might know the love which I have more abundantly unto you. But if any have caused grief, he hath not grieved me, but in part, that I might not overcharge you all. Sufficient to such a man is this punishment, which was inflicted of many. So that contrarywise, ye ought rather to forgive him and comfort him, lest perhaps such a one should be swallowed up with overmuch sorrow. Wherefore I beseech you that ye would confirm your love toward him. For to this end also did I write, that I might know the proof of you, whether ye be obedient in all things. So the one that they eventually kicked out from amongst them, who was committing that sin, who was being with his father's wife, they are told right here to, contrary or wise, ye ought rather to forgive him and comfort him, lest perhaps a one should be swallowed up with overmuch sorrow. Sorrow for one, his sin, and sorrow two, that he was kicked out, and sorrow three, that he was a permanent enemy. Wherefore I beseech you that ye would confirm your love toward him. Note one thing, okay? He's telling them, hey, okay, I think personally the guy repented. Okay, I, that's what I personally believe, that the guy in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, that he repented. And Paul's like, hey, okay, forgive him. Confirm your love to him. But note what it doesn't say. It says nothing about bringing him back into fellowship with him, with them. Does it? Let's keep reading. To whom ye forgive anything, I forgive also. For if I forgave anything to whom I forgave it, for your sakes forgave I it in the person of Christ, lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. So, right there, again, he's like, hey, if you forgive him, I forgive him. Okay? Forgive him. Confirm your love. Look, we, we did that out of love for you. Okay? You couldn't be messed up with that kind of garbage. Okay? So, because you were messed up with that, we had you couldn't be around us. Of course not. You're in sin. Okay? I'm mean, look, you're you're in blatant sin like that. I'm not going to have anything to do with you. Get out of here unless you infect other people. And hey, we we were boasting of how we were just okay with it and letting you coast by. Not anymore. Okay? But there again. Note that it does not say anything about bringing him back into fellowship. That's the thing. See, when you have a disagreement with a brother or a sister, um, it doesn't always mean that that fellowship that you once had is going to be restored. And that is sadly the truth of the matter. I've, I've been in many situations with brethren who we would have fellowship, but something happened like, the individual up north, um, we had ourselves a vehement disagreement, vehement disagreement, vehement. I can no longer, I won't talk to the man. Forgive him. He is my brother. I love him. If he were to get a hold of me out of the blue, it's like, hey, Brad, pray for me. I need you to pray for me. Absolutely. But as far as fellowship, not happening. Not going to have fellowship with him, nor he with me. That's part of it, okay? When brethren have disagreements like that, that happens. If someone that is of the church of the living God, who's in sin, you admonish them, and they still choose their sin, and it's like, hey, look, stay away from me. I don't want nothing to do with you while you're in this thing, okay? That doesn't always mean that the fellowship that you once had is going to be restored. More often than not, it means the opposite, that they're going to go their own ways. 
that's a sad part of the reality of what happens when a little leaven gets in and leaveneth the whole lump. Don't be destroyed by that. Don't be overly broken over that because, brethren, it happens. It happens. I, I know that some of you get devastated by that, you know, because of you want that fellowship that you once had. But when something like that, sin gets in the way or pride gets in the way or whatever it is, and yet there is a mending there because you are both of the church of the living God, you know, look at Paul and Barnabas. They never worked together again over a disagreement about letting in Mark. It happens, brethren. Okay? It happens. And brother, don't let that eat you up, okay? It's, it hurts. <laughs> Hello, it hurts. But it happens. Go on. Don't stay back here. But move forward, okay? You know who you are. Let's continue. Furthermore, when I came to Troas to preach Christ's gospel, and a door was opened unto me of the Lord, I had no rest in my spirit, because I found not Titus my brother. But taking my leave of them, I went from thence into Macedonia. Now thanks be unto God, which always causeth us to triumph in Christ, and maketh manifest the savor of his knowledge by us in every place. For we are unto God a sweet savor of Christ, in them that are saved, and in them that perish. To the one we are the savor of death unto death, and to the other the savor of life unto life. And who is sufficient for these things? For we are not as many which corrupt the word of God like the easy believism devils do. Like these love gospel devils do. But of a sincerity, but as of God, in the sight of God, speak we in Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 7. 2 Corinthians chapter 7. Big part. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Perfecting holiness, being separate in the fear of God. Paul never talked about the fear of God. Are you blind? Receive us. We have wronged no man. We have corrupted no man. We have defrauded no man. I speak not this to condemn you, for I have said before that ye are in our hearts to die and live with you. Great is my boldness of speech toward you. Great is my glorying of you. I am filled with comfort. I am exceedingly joyful in all our tribulation. For when we were come into Macedonia, our flesh had no rest. But we were troubled on every side. Without were fightings. Within were fears. Fightings. Within were fears. Nevertheless, God that comforteth those that are cast down, comforted us by the coming of Titus. And not by his coming only, but by the consolation wherewith he was comforted in you. When he told us, your earnest desire, your mourning, your mourning, your fervent mind toward me, so that I rejoice the more. For though I made you sorry with the letter, I do not repent, though I did repent. For I perceive that the same epistle hath made you sorry, though it were but for a season. Talking to, going to a brother with those hard things that you need to talk to him about. It's like, hey brother, let's talk. You know, I remember uh, somebody asked me, it's like, well, how do you hide God's word in your heart? What? What do you mean, how do you do that? If you're of the church of the living God, you, you know. You know 
I just like I, I can't explain that to you. Because if you're of the church of the living God, you know what it means to have God's word hidden in your heart. Why would you ask me that? For though I made you sorry with a letter, I did not repent, though I did repent. For I perceive that the same epistle hath made you sorry, though it were but for a season. Now I rejoice, not that ye were made sorry, but that ye sorrowed to repentance. For ye were made sorry after a godly manner, that ye might receive damage by us in nothing. Now see, the easy believe is some heretic. We'll come to godly sorrow here and say, see, it's only talking about saved people. Therefore, saved people are the only ones who can have godly sorrow. No, that's not true. Okay, godly sorrow is a two-edged sword. Okay, yes, those who are of God have godly sorrow for sin. Yes, but to be brought onto salvation, you will have godly sorrow because it's your fault that God died, buried, and rose again the third day according to the scriptures and shed his blood on the cross. It's your fault that he did that. Hence, you are having godly sorrow. See? See? That's one of the things that the easy believism devils will harp upon. That lost people can't have godly sorrow. Go pound sand there, Mr. Smiley Canadian buddy boy. You're full of yourself. Okay? Remember, you're saved by your own belief. It's not true. Okay? Yes, lost people, when they are coming to the Lord on his terms, broken, contrition, which is godly sorrow, and fear of the Lord, which will result in you calling upon his name, which they dispute, of course. Yes, lost people can have godly sorrow. That, that's what Romans 1, 2, and 3 is about. Okay? But yeah, remember, you easy believe as heretics, you don't deal with Romans 1 and 2. And especially in Romans chapter 3, you really don't like verses 10 on to verse 18, do you? No, you, you strip away all that and get right to belief. Go pound some sand, buddy. Okay? Verse 10. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation... Not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. For see, okay, now look at verse 9. Now I rejoice not that ye were made sorry, but that ye sorrow to repentance, for ye were made sorry after a godly manner. Saved. Were made sorry after a godly manner. That ye might receive damage by us in nothing. Then, for godly sorrow worketh repentance... To salvation. If you're already saved, you don't need to be saved again. Okay? So see in verses 9 and 10, he's explaining the two edges of that two-edged sword. That godly sorrow works, yes, godly sorrow on those who are saved, but in those who are not saved, who are coming unto the Lord according to his own condition. To his, um, to his uh, commandments, you know, not his commandments, um, to his conditions, excuse me, excuse me, yeah, his conditions. God's conditions for salvation are simple. Be broken of your self-righteousness, godly sorrow that worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. Godly sorrow, it's your fault that he did all that on the cross, okay? So see, verses 9 and 10 clearly tell us that godly sorrow has two folds. It's a two-edged sword. We who are godly of the church of the living God, of course, but those who are to be saved of our Lord Jesus Christ, coming to him on his terms through brokenness, godly sorrow. See, you're broken of yourself, and you go to the Lord in brokenness, you're going to be made aware. You're going to have godly sorrow. Why? Because you're going to be afraid of him because he's going to send you to hell. And being sent to hell, that's not the sorrow of the world there, buddy. Let's continue. 
For behold, this selfsame thing that ye sorrowed after a godly sort. Now, godly sort. Sorrowed after a godly sort. See, you get chastised. What does those of the church of the living God who get messed up in sin, what do they do? They sorrow after a godly sort. What carefulness it wrought in you, yea, what clearing of yourselves, yea, what indignation, yea, what fear, yea, what vehement desire, yea, what zeal, yea, what revenge. In all things ye have approved yourselves to be clear in this matter. See, verse 11 discusses about what the saved person in godly sorrow for what they have done will behave in chastisement or when they're called out on something when the Lord's like hey you're in sin stop it oh, I'm not gonna do it fine everybody turns against you you get kicked out then it's just you and the Lord you have the church of the living God that chastisement will lead to verse 11 here in someone who is of the church of the living God true repentance turning and note how it says in here okay let's read this again for behold, the selfsame thing that ye sorrowed after a godly sort. What carefulness it wrought in you, yea. What clearing of yourselves, yea. What indignation, yea. What fear. When I've given myself over to my sin, and uh, the Lord who dwells in, within me is a prad, why, what, what's wrong with you? My brothers and sisters, you know, you know that fear that you get, that terror. If you were to die in that sin right then and there that the that you did, saved, born again, converted to the Church of the Living God, you were to die, stand before the Lord. You you wouldn't be able to get low enough, would you? Because the Lord's going to look down at you it's like what you got to say for yourself boy well, what are you going to say <laughs> what are you going to say oh beg your pardon hmm? what are you going to say you ain't going to say nothing are you see now those of you at the church of the living God you know what I'm talking about don't you that fear yeah, that produces in you some fear, Jack, doesn't it? Yeah, sure does. Verse 12. Wherefore, though I wrote unto you, I did it not for his cause that had done the wrong, nor for his cause that suffered wrong, but that our care for you in the sight of God might appear unto you. Now get a load of verse 12. Get a load of verse 12. Paul says, I did it not for the cause that, I did it not for his cause that had done the wrong, nor for his cause that suffered wrong, but that our care for you, Church of the Living God, the body of Christ, in the sight of God might appear unto you. Meaning, if he didn't love you, you wouldn't have said anything to them. If you don't love someone, you're not going to say anything to them. But if you love them, and you're of the church of the living God, you're going to say something to them. If you have to, who knows if the Lord does, hasn't done it already through the scriptures or someone else. But if you love someone of the church of the living God, you are truly going to tell them, because the Lord is going to put it upon you to do so. Therefore we were comforted in your comfort, yea, and exceedingly the more joyed we for the joy of Titus, because the Spirit was refreshed by you all. For if I have boasted anything to him of you, I am not ashamed, but as we spake all things to you in truth, even as so our boasting which I made before Titus is found a truth, and his inward affection is more abundant toward you, whilst he remembereth the obedience of you all. How with fear and trembling ye received him. I rejoice, therefore, that I have confidence in you in all things.
Oh, quite a lesson there, huh, boy? Now go to 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 8 on to verse 13. Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel, wherein I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even unto bonds, but the word of God is not bound. Therefore I endure all things for the elect's sakes, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. It is a faithful saying, For if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him, dead to the world. If we suffer for standing with Christ according to the scripture, we shall also reign with him. If he if we deny him, he will also he also will deny us. Now that's not talking about our salvation. Think about what we've been talking about. If we deny him, he will also deny us. The Lord says to you, don't go there. Says to you again, if you go there, this and this is going to happen to you. Then a brother or a sister is like, hey, I, maybe you shouldn't go there. And then you do. And then he denies that protection uh, from you. Because if any man defile the temple, we'll look at that. If any man defile the temple of God, him will God destroy? That includes you. Yourself too, brother, sister, yeah. So if you deny him, he also deny you. Not salvifically. If you're saved, born again, converted, you're once saved, always saved. You're of the church of the living God. You're a new creature in Christ. Okay? You're saved, you're once saved, always saved. Absolutely. But see, you deny him when he's like, don't do that, don't do that, okay? Lord, I hurt myself. Well, what do you expect, you numbskull? I told you not to do that. He denied you. See? Where, where, where did we just, where did we leave off, leave off, okay? If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful. He cannot deny himself. Hmm. He cannot deny himself. What does that mean? If we believe not, Lord, you're really going to do this? You're really going to be there for me? You're really going to help me? Yet he abideth faithful. He cannot deny himself. See, when you are truly saved, born again, converted, okay? <laughs> when you are truly saved, go to the book of Ephesians, okay? When you are truly saved, Ephesians chapter 1, all right? Verses 13 on to verse 14. In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of, of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of your inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession, that's the catching away, Unto the praise of his glory. You're sealed until the day of redemption. The day of redemption is the catching away. Okay? You're sealed, once saved, always saved. Okay? You're, you're once saved, always saved. But also remember, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 30. Okay? Now the context here is making the comparison between Christ and his church the body of Christ, the church of the living God, between a man and wife. He's, uh, Paul's making that comparison. But look at verse 30. For we are members, uh, Ephesians 5 verse 30. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. So in 2 Timothy verse 13, if we believe not, Yet he abideth faithful. He cannot deny himself. See, you are sealed until the day of redemption. That doesn't mean you're a little Christ, you wicked Catholics. Okay? No. 
No. No. See, you can't be sinless. God can't sin. See, people say about, and I have a video, the Lord, excuse me, the Lord gave me to do a video on Are We Little Christ. If I can remember, I'll put it in the description box. Okay. But um, yeah, when you hear people say imitate Christ, Christ is God the Father. Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. Okay. He is God the Father. God can't sin. So you have someone saying imitate Christ. You mean be sinless? Yeah. Yeah, get over yourself. Yeah. Uh, run away from anyone who says imitate Christ. Uh, you will not find the word imitate at all in the authorized version of the scriptures, by the way. Okay? But we are part of his bones and of his flesh. Okay? Okay? So when he says he cannot deny himself, that means... We are part of his bones and his flesh, of his body, okay? We are part of him. We are not sinless like he is, okay? So get over yourself. We can't raise the dead. We can't walk on water. We can't miraculously provide fishies and bread for people, okay? We are not sinless. We can't be sinless, okay? That's impossible in the flesh, okay? That's impossible. But go to 1 Corinthians chapter... 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, okay? Verses 16 on to verse 19, as I was saying to you, know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man, them, and yourself, hi, hi, any man, that them, and you yourself, defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy by handing him over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord, day of the Lord Jesus, if you are of the church of the living God. Okay? And that, no, uh, wait, 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 where was it? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, set apart, other than that. Which temple ye are? Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seemeth to be wise in this world, let him become a fool, that he may become wise. See, it's twisted backwards in this verse here. Because wisdom is equated to the fear of the Lord. But see, if any man among you seemeth to be wise in this world, fearing the things of the world of man, let him become a fool in the eyes of the world, that he may be wise. For the wisdom of this world, the uh, fear of man, the fear of this world, is foolishness with God. For it is written, He taketh the wise in their own craftiness. Uh-huh. So, we are part of his bones and of his flesh. And if any man, including yourself, defile the temple of God, him will God destroy? Have you given that up yet? How, how much more, how much longer is God going to put up with telling you, you better stop this? I, I don't want to know the shame of standing before, before the Lord because he had to kill me because I wouldn't give up certain sins that some of you are living in. That you have, you know, I'm sorry. You know, I don't want to stand, I don't want to be in sin and have the Lord kill me because I chose that sin over the Lord. Is God admonishing you? Is God warning you and you're not going to God? Are you afraid of what he'll tell you? Now go to Romans, O oh, beloved Romans, chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, verses 1 under verse 17. 
There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the capital S spirit, after the Lord. Remember, the Lord said we are to abide in him because we can do nothing outside of him unless we abide in him. Do you abide in the Lord every single day? He's in you. Yes, he is. But, you know, like the hymn says, he walks with me. No. He's in us. We are to walk with him, not vice versa. Okay? We are to walk with him, not the other way around. Okay? Good hymn. Don't agree with that. But. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made, hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh. You Catholics hate this. I know you do. God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. Yes, the flesh of Jesus Christ was sinful. God himself, Jesus never sinned. But see, the temptation that God had was of the flesh, okay? God cannot be tempted to do evil. God cannot sin. But God in flesh, the flesh is sinful, see? That's why God was able to go through what we went through because he was in flesh and he knew just how sinful flesh is, okay? God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. This is where sin is. In the skin suit. The sin suit. You know, your little wafer cookie God, you despicable Catholic scoundrel. Okay, sin is, this is where sin is in the flesh. It, 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 it says so right there. Get over it. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. But they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. When Paul, in the book of Acts, when he was admonished not to go to Jerusalem, you think he was minding the things of the flesh? He was, he was thinking he was doing a big spiritual old thing, but he's like, why are you going to break my heart? When the Lord admonished him twice, and then the people, in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word will be established. Yet he still went. You tell me. You tell me, okay? Was Paul walking in the spirit then? For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Romans chapter 6, verses 17 on to verse 23. But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Being made free from sin, ye became the servants of not slaves. Slaves have no choice. Servants have a choice. Okay. You're not a robot. Ye became the servants of righteousness. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh where sin is condemned to. Okay? For as ye have yielded your members' servants to uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity, even so now, yield your members, servants, to righteousness unto holiness. See, you got guys like John MacArthur saying this ought to be slave. Slaves don't have a choice. Servants do. Okay? Yes. You're not being held at gunpoint to serve God. If you don't do it the way he tells you to, 
You're going to reap a heavy price. The sword will never depart from your house. And while you think to do things in secret, the Lord is going to expose you openly. Remember David. Yeah, the easy believers is some heretics. God still used David. Look what it cost him. He still used him, but it cost him plenty. And if David could have redone it again, he wouldn't have. Neither would have you, huh? For when ye were the servants of sin, ye were free from righteousness. What fruit had ye then in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now being made free from sin and become servants to God, not at gunpoint, not a slave, ye have your fruit unto holiness, being separate other than that, and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Go back to Romans chapter 8. Picking up at verse 7. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. Carnal, fleshly. For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. You don't have the Spirit of Christ, you're not of Christ. You don't have the Holy Ghost, you're not of Christ. You're not, you're not saved. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. What does this mean? Look at Romans chapter 7, okay? Verses 20 unto 25. Now, if I do that, I would not. It is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find that now sin that dwelleth in me. We are made in the image of God. We have a spirit, we have a soul, we have a body. And according to verse 3 in Romans chapter 8, sin has been condemned to where? The body. Okay? The body. The flesh. Remember, genius, it was the Word made flesh. It wasn't the flesh. It was the Word made flesh. All flesh is sinful. Filthy Catholic. Okay? But, let's continue. Where did we, uh, where did we, oh yeah, from verse 20. If I, I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. Why? Because our spirit and soul are housed in the skin suit. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man, that inward man, the seal until the day of redemption, our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father, okay? But I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. Law of sin. Sin has been condemned to the flesh, okay? O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Who? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. Paul is not giving a condoning to sin. What he is saying is he understood, obviously. See, that separation made without hands, Jesus, uh, that uh, circumcision made without hands, we have Jesus Christ living within us, okay? So anything we do in our flesh is not going to affect our soul, okay? It'll affect a lot of other things, but it won't affect our soul, okay? Sin has been condemned to the flesh. Our spirit and soul are God's, but the flesh, sin, is earthly, okay? So Paul is saying, look, Paul believed, by the way, in sinless perfection. Oh, yes, he did. But, okay, but 
When you look at verse 15 and 19, look at verse 15. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. What is he talking about? Sin. And verse 19. For the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. See, Paul believed in sinless perfection. But see, Paul understood, hey, while my spirit and soul are in this skin suit, I'm going to sin. It's impossible for me not to sin because that, there is in me nothing good. That is in my flesh. Okay? That doesn't mean that you have a license to go sin. Okay? But absolutely not. Read Romans chapter 6. Okay? The wages of sin is death. And if you're saying, well, then now get me to uh, God quicker, the Lord rebuke you. That's not what someone of the church of the living God would say. Because you're here to serve him, to be an ambassador for him. No, the Lord rebuke you. If you're the church of the living God and condoning your sin and giving yourself, well, it's going to get me home quicker. The Lord rebuke you. The Lord rebuke you. No, Paul understood that, look, I'm going to do my best to not sin. But see, when I sin, I understand that it's because of the flesh. My mind and my heart, they belong to God. But my flesh, which can corrupt my mind to get my mind off on the other things, and my heart can be, you know, diverted, yes. But because we are in the flesh, meaning our soul and spirit are in the skin suit, we're going to sin. Do you really understand verses 24 and 25, dear friend? Let's continue. From verse 10 in uh, Romans chapter 8. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you... He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. Meaning he will give you what you need in your mortal body. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the spirit do mortify, put down, the deeds of the body ye shall live. See verses 12 and 13. Yes, saved people can get messed up in sin. For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. And kill your testimony with it. And you're supposed to be an ambassador for Jesus Christ. You're an ambassador? And you're going to serve him like that so they can see that? Come on now. Come on now. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, suffer by not being conformed to that, that we may be also glorified together. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. All right. Sorry about that, brother. Colossians chapter 3. I have to um, skip some of the things that uh, we were going to talk about because time constraint. Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 on to verse 17. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things of the earth. 
For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and, covetous, and covetousness, which is idolatry. And all of that stuff is idolatry. For which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. Uh, wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. Someone who hears the gospel and rejects it. You're a, children, you're a child of disobedience. You're a child of wrath. Okay, You reject the gospel, coming to our Lord broken and contrite, and in fear of the Lord call upon his name that he may save you. Uh, if you don't come to him on those terms, his terms, God's love is not for you. God's wrath is for you. Uh, meaning God hates you. Oh, yeah, God so loved and gave. Okay? Okay? Don't fall for this God loves you. No, no. God doesn't love everybody. Only those who come to him on his terms. Okay? In the which ye also walked some time. When ye lived in them, but now ye also put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, Barbarian, Scythian, bond or free, but Christ is all and in all. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, elect meaning the way of the cross, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another, and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And in context, that's in the church of the living God. Because as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. Unless you come to the Lord on his terms, uh, but guess what, Jack? You ain't forgiven. You're a thief and a robber. You go up some other way because you just believe. You're not forgiven. And as 4.13, I've had disagreements, vehement disagreements with brethren. But I have bear no grudge or have nothing against any of my brothers, excuse me, or sisters of the Church of the Living God. I ain't got nothing against any one of you. I'm not going to fellowship with some of you but I've got no problem with you. Why? Because we're admonished. Forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And in context, this is talking to what? About who and for who? The Church of the Living God. And above all these things, put on charity, which is self-sacrifice which is the bond of perfectness, self-sacrifice. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also ye are called in one body, and be ye thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Whatsoever ye do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. And whatsoever ye do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. How are you going to uh, do uh, this uh, in word or deed? How are you going to do it in the name of the Lord Jesus when you're getting drunk? Huh? Are you getting drunk in the name of the Lord Jesus? Huh? 
Are you smoking that cigarette in the name of the Lord Jesus, huh? Are you looking at pornography in the name of the Lord Jesus, huh? Huh? Are you bending to the Catholic created dictates of today in the name of the Lord Jesus? Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Now that denotes a thing of pride, that you don't get uh, puffed up, but that that person, that brother or sister who is in sin, that you don't get brought down to their level of sin by trying to restore such a one. Got to be mindful of yourself sometimes in those matters. Okay? Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Charity, self-sacrifice. For if a man think himself to be something, when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. For of dust thou art, and unto dust thou shalt return. Naked came you out of your mother's womb, and naked shall you return hither. The Lord hath given, the Lord can take away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. But let every man prove his own work. And then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. Examine yourselves. Prove your own selves, whether you be in the faith. And where it says rejoicing in himself alone, that's not pride of yourself who lives within you. You know, if you're to give, your uh, right hand is not supposed to know what your left hand doeth. Okay? And who dwells within you, church of the living God, huh? For every man shall bear his own burden. Let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit, capital S, the Lord, shall of the Spirit, capital S, the Lord, reap life everlasting. Reap life ever uh, everlasting. It says reap, not gain. Reap. There's a difference between reaping and gain. Okay? Okay? And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap, if we faint not. As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. Take care of your own first, my brothers and sisters. You see how large a letter I have written unto you with mine own hand. As many as desire to make a fair shoe in the flesh, these Jesuit Catholic coadjutors, okay, who worship their little wafer cookie, okay, they want to make a fair shoe in the flesh by turning you against the Lord with their nonsensical doctrines, okay? For as many as desire to make a fair shoe in the flesh, they constrain you to be circumcised only lest they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. For neither they themselves who are circumcised keep the law, but desire to have you circumcised that they may glory in your flesh. Because the devil is all about flesh, remember. 
But God, right here, but God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. We have to. Bear with me. Galatians chapter 2, verses 20 under verse 21. Of course, come on. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not frustrate the grace of God. For if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. How do you frustrate the grace of God? By quenching the Spirit? By ignoring Him? By denying Him? By walking your own way? By offering God a choice to choose for you instead of Him choosing for you? You making a choice without going to the Lord first? But God forbid that I should glory, back in Galatians. But God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. As many as walk according to this rule, peace be on them, peace, on, peace be on them, and mercy, and upon the Israel of God, from henceforth, let no man trouble me, for I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, the, of the Lord Jesus, excuse me. Brethren, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. Verses 7 and 8. Be not deceived. God is not mocked, for whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. You reap what you sow, boy. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. And Colossians chapter 3, verse 17. And whatsoever ye do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. Again, are you getting drunk in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ? Are you smoking a cigarette in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ? Are you watching pornography in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ? Are you watching Hollywood movies in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ? Hmm? You're not deceived. God is not mocked. The answer, of course, is abiding in Christ. Can we do that perfectly every moment of the day? No. No. No, but you need to be admonished, brethren. And remember, this is a daily walk. One step before another. Okay? Why, why do you think the Lord tells us not to worry about tomorrow, but only to be concentrated with today? Because sufficient for the day is the evil thereof. You know, boast not thyself of the morrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. Sufficient for the day is the evil thereof. You don't know what you're going to face today. And we're, I can't see that, beg your pardon. But we're told here, and whatsoever ye do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. Do you think David was doing all for the Lord when he went into Bathsheba? Hmm? What about Joshua? Hey, uh, the apostles in uh, Acts chapter 1. Hey, God here. Here's what we've chose. You choose between what we've chose. He didn't choose none of it. I'm ready to go to Jerusalem. The Lord's like, don't. The Lord's like, uh, you you do, this will kind of happen to you. Hey guys, warn them. They say, hey, maybe you shouldn't. Why are you breaking my heart? I'm ready to die. I'm sure you are. 
But he went anyway. See, when we as a church of the living God don't go to God, but decide to do things in our own power, we're going to reap a heavy consequence. And see those consequences. <laughs> those consequences is what these devils don't want you to look at. And the manner in which you serve the Lord reflects our Lord. And if we are admonished here, again, and whatsoever ye do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. Right there. The next time you're going into an endeavor or whatever, it's like, okay, something's got to be done. Lord, here are a couple of options. What do you choose? Put that before the Lord, and you know what? Here's, here's, a, here's a thought. Wait. But I can't wait. Got to be now. Yeah, just like the apostles who right away chose Matthias, who came to naught apparently. Apparently, like I said, you don't see anything of him past Acts chapter 1. Or you're going to be admonished and go anyway when the Lord says, don't do that. I told you not to. This is what's going to happen. Okay, see, I'm done. Okay, fine. Go ahead. <laughs> so that's going to be it for this video. That's going to be it for this video. Uh, hopefully this will help a couple of you, I hope, I pray. Because, like I said, I, I know... I know a lot of you struggle with these things. And in light of the times that we are living in right now, I, I, I get it. I get it. I get it. Yes, those who are saved with the Church of the Living God, yes, we can get messed up with all kinds of sin. Yes, we can, absolutely. But see, it comes at a price. Yeah, true, it doesn't cost us our salvation. That's true. But what does the Lord mean to you? You brethren out there who are struggling with addictions, whatever it is, what does the Lord mean to you? What does the Lord mean to you? You say everything. Good. I believe you. Then why don't you give up that addiction? Are you certain that the road you are going down is the way the Lord would have you to go. Are you certain? Did you wait for him to give you the response? Or did you set your heart upon it despite anything that he would say to you? And those of us of the Church of the Living God, we got to remember this about ourselves and also our brethren, that our spirit and soul are in the skin suit. We are to have mercy upon our saved brethren, our sisters, our brothers, okay? Um, like I said, that does not mean that fellowship that might have been there once before is going to be reestablished. Like I said, history, at least with me, has shown that most more often than not, that means that there's going to be a, not going to go back to that. You know, it's unfortunate with some because um, there are some who I really enjoyed having fellowship with, but in light of current events, never going to happen now. But that's okay. See, once once we get up uh, with the Lord, it's not going to matter. Our petty little issues of the flesh just aren't going to matter once we're with the Lord. So, like I said, that's going to be it for this video. I hope, I hope this has uh, 
helped you. This was a, a little long. Um, it would have been longer. We we did skip uh, a few. Um, like I wanted to read uh, 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 through 10. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 22 on to verse 25. Colossians 1, 21 on to verse 29. Ephesians 4, 1 through 6, then 17 through 32. Uh, kind of skipped over that to kind of get to the point. I think you got the point, so it's going to be it. Thank you to all of you who pray for us. My wife recently has gotten this um, activated charcoal. And Lord willing, so far, that might be helping a little bit. It might be. She's only been on it for about three days three or four, maybe, no, three days, she's been on this activated charcoal stuff. And, um, knock on wood, you know, so far it's it's been helping, it seems. Yay! Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And also, she's having her hip issues still, so please keep us in prayer for that. Like I said, um, yesterday for me, oh, boy, I was, I was sick with something. Uh, go <laughs> yeah but um, yeah I was pretty sick with something that's rare I don't get sick usually so that's why I see me drinking this so. but anyway please keep us in your prayers we 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 pray for many of you don't forget our brethren in Australia don't forget each other excuse me don't forget the babes And even though you don't like one another sometimes, remember they, that if they're of the church of the living God, they are your brethren. They are your sisters. Even if you don't like them. While you might not like them, if they came to you in a need, they're your brothers, your sisters. Would you help them? I would. What about you? Thank you so much for watching this. If you do, I love you, we love you, and we will see you in the next video.